Welcome to our worship service at Enola Emanuel United Methodist Church. We would like to recognize the graduates from our church family that we know about. The college graduates are Amber and Sarah. High school graduates are Johnny, Jonathan, Luke, and Shannon. Congratulations on this achievement on their life's journey. The call to worship is Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 2. Therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good pleasing and perfect will. Hello, I'm Gary Shockley. I am the Director of Equipping Vital Congregations for the Susquehanna Conference. And I bid you greetings on behalf of Bishop Jeremiah Park and the members of the Cabinet and myself. It is a pleasure to be here. I was grateful when Mindy asked me to step in while she's having a good time with Jason and little Theo. What a joy he is and I know that uh, you are thrilled with having this new addition to your church family as well. These have been challenging times for us. Uh, I, I think of this in terms of we've, we're dealing with difficulties in politics, and then we've been focusing on a global pandemic, and now we are all cognizant of the protests that are happening around the country and really around the world. This is a time when we think the world is just falling apart, but as we worship, we remind ourselves that God is always with us, and as long as God is with us, all will be well. So I bring you also this letter from our bishop, who asked that we share this with each of our local churches. It's a lengthy letter, but it's one that's filled with incredible thoughts about the shape that the world is in, and especially the latest regarding the protests. So, from Psalm 35. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their ravages, my life from the lions. Dear brothers and sisters of the Susquehanna Conference, grace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, healer of our brokenness and hope of the world. My heart is breaking as I write this pastoral letter to you. My heart cries with the psalmist, How long, O Lord, will you look on? My soul is restless and disturbed. I keep praying, show me the way I should go, as I pray for people in harm's way, while violent clashes continue and escalate. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. It is with deep anguish, sorrow, and then righteous anger that I watched in abject horror, along with millions of people, the slow death of Mr. George, George Floyd. We all heard him cry out, I can't breathe. We watched in stunned silence as he laid constrained and gasped his last breaths under the choking knee. Today we are confronted by two killers who steal breath. The coronavirus shortens the breath of its victims. Racism chokes the breath, both figuratively and literally, out of its victims and suffocates righteousness from society. Life requires breath. Is breathing not a basic right? The breath of God, however, fills people with renewed life. We remember that Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. This past Sunday, we read in Acts chapter 2 about the Pentecost experience of those early believers. While they were gathered in a house in Jerusalem, they heard the rush of a mighty wind, and flames like tongues of fire rested upon each of them. People who had come to the city from many nations were able to hear in their own languages. These spirit-filled believers speak of God's good news in Jesus Christ. This breath of God changed the direction of history. It inaugurated the coming of the realm of God, a focal message that Jesus frequently proclaimed. It's intriguing that the risen Christ uses 40 days between his resurrection and ascension to speak about the realm of God. We are reminded that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The work of building the realm of God continues. Now we must act with courage and conviction as God's breath of justice and righteousness in our own time and place. The miracle of Pentecost was one of both speaking and hearing. We must claim the miracle of speaking. Those of us who claim Christ's name cannot stand idly by and allow racism free reign. We must condemn boldly and loudly the sin of racism. God's people are to speak up that racism does not have a place in God's realm. We must also claim the miracle of hearing. We must hear the stories and the truths of victims of racism to whom we have turned a deaf ear. We must learn their language of suffering, pain, frustration, anger, hope, and resilience. We must amplify their voices. I invite you, my sisters and brothers, to a time of prayer for the Pentecost miracle of the tongues and ears and to repentance. We must fall on our knees and ask God to open our mouths and ears and ask for God's forgiveness for our silence when we should have spoken out and our speaking when we should have been listening. We in the Susquehanna Conference are called in, a, in our vision and mission to embody the beloved community of Christ. Martin Luther King Jr. broadened the term beloved community to describe a society in which no one goes hungry or homeless. Racism and bigotry would be overcome by an inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood and love and trust would triumph over fear and hate. Beloved communities do not allow racism and prejudice to flourish. Beloved communities do not accept discrimination and violence against those who are different because of pigments of skin. Beloved communities do not, through silence, permit institutional racism. Beloved communities do not allow the cries of the oppressed to echo unanswered for generations. As the believers at Pentecost told of God's deeds of power, so we must raise our voices to proclaim the good news of God's justice, righteousness, and promise of reconciliation and new life for those who turn from wicked ways. Let us as individuals and as a conference join together and rededicate ourselves to bringing the beloved community of Christ to fruition so that all may be free from the chains of hate and fear. We are in the season after Pentecost. It's about the fresh breath of God that creates the wind that changes the direction of human destiny toward justice, reconciliation, and peace. Let the hallowed wind of the Spirit ignite the holy fire of passion for and commitment and dedication to the vision of the beloved community of Christ for such a time as this. How long, O oh Lord, will you look on? As I utter those words, I must ask myself and each of you, how will we in church hasten the heralding of God's reign? Indeed, we are in this together. With you in Christ's ministry, Jeremiah Park. I invite us into a moment of silent prayer as we allow these words to sink deeply into our hearts. And as I continue to pray as we worship God together. God, there are times I've wondered if you cry. You are God, surely you can be above emotions. But I believe you do cry. And your tears flow from the eyes of those who face oppression and violence. Your eyes flow from those who are victims of hate and indifference. Your tears flow from those who are treated as less than human and discounted. And I believe your tears also flow 
when the people gathered in this place in worship. As we think about our place in all of this, as we struggle knowing that many of us are privileged, we struggle knowing that we don't know what to do. And so we turn to you, many of us in tears. God, teach us how to listen first before we speak. Part of the bridge of reconciliation is just being still in the presence of others so that we see them and we hear them and we respond by being with them. Open our hearts, O oh God, as we worship this day, as we read scripture, as we entertain this message together. Continue to breathe on us and in us. We offer ourselves wholeheartedly to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading for this morning, or this afternoon, <clears throat> is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. I think it's a timely word for you and me as we gather in this place and in your places. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. For is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat? Or... What will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed your heavenly Father already knows that you need them. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In early March, my wife Kim and I decided that we would travel to Colorado to visit with our newest grandson, Jetson Craig. Don't you love that name? When we left Pennsylvania, the coronavirus was something that was happening on the West Coast and East Coast and other parts of the world. There were no signs of it at all in Colorado or the western part of the states, and so we thought with the limited time we had that we would travel out there and everything would be fine. But even after taking every precaution and being extremely careful about our contact with the people in the community, I somehow contracted the virus. And on the ninth day of our 10th day visit, 10 day visit, I started becoming symptomatic. Isolated myself from the rest of the family. And as we headed to the airport in order to get away from them and get home, I called the doctor who confirmed my symptoms, said that there was no way I could be tested, but I was to get home as quickly as possible and isolate myself for two to four weeks. I was sicker than I remember being in a long, long time. 
and consider myself fortunate that I likely had a mild to moderate case of COVID-19. I have to confess to you that when this thing first appeared in our country, I thought to myself, well, okay, you know, it'll, it'll be around for a while, it'll run its course, then everything will get back to normal. Right now we just need to stay put. We ought to just take care of ourselves and after a few weeks it will all pass. And even while being sick, I kept thinking to myself, in a month or two, when all of this is over, I'll be able to get back on track to do all the things that I've been looking and planning to do. Part of my way of coping was to hook my hopes on the future. Someday I'll be able to do this. Well, I'll be able to look forward to this event or that experience or this trip. One of the things that I, I did was make an assessment of all the stuff I was going to be doing. In early April, I was participating in an artist retreat in Belfont, Pennsylvania. A friend of mine has a farm. People gather from all over the country to sit outside to paint beautiful landscapes. I've been trying for two years to sign up for it. In mid-April, I was to serve as a retreat leader for something planned a year and a half ago in the desert of Palm Springs, California where I would teach about spiritual disciplines and then would take people out into the desert to paint. I look forward to a long weekend in the Shenandoah Valley to celebrate my 63rd birthday with my wife and two close friends. I was to preside over a family, a family wedding in Western Carolina two weeks from now. And all the work events I had scheduled and filled my beautiful calendar with were suddenly canceled. And like everyone else, I've been stuck in my house, working from home, in a virtual world. And here we are, virtually. As I've come to reflect on all of this, I've understood that I coped with this pandemic by hooking all of my hopes and my sense of purpose, my sanity, on future things. And one by one, like many of you, I watched them dissolve away. And as I became unhooked with each of these events, one by one, I felt loss, I felt grief, anger at times, and deep disappointment. And then I read that scripture from Matthew chapter 6, and it stopped me in my tracks. Eugene Peterson, in his version, the message, message captures verse 34 with these words. Jesus said, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Wow. Now, I, I know these things. I believe these things. But I still struggle with these things. Jesus reminded me in the moment of stopping to read that scripture that all I have, that all we have, is this present moment. And what matters most is making this moment count. Forget about tomorrow, Jesus said. Don't worry about tomorrow and what's to come. You'll find a way through them when that time comes. I believe Jesus is right. So the question that came to me as I read the scripture is, how do I reorient my life? How do I readjust, reconnoiter in order to make this possible, to live more fully in this moment? A long time ago, I became acquainted with a man by the name of Viktor Frankl who was an Austrian neurologist, psychologist, was a Nazi concentration camp prisoner and survivor. And during the three years of his captivity, he lost his mother and his brother and his wife at the hands of the Nazis. From a very early age, Victor was capti captivated by, by human development and human behavior. He knew even as a child that he wanted to give his life to working on some kind of profession that would help people cope with challenging situations. 
In the concentration camps, he studied how the men around him were coping with suffering or failing to cope in healthy ways. He counseled them. He became a confidant. He offered words of meaning and hope. And then he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. The copy I have at home was published in 1963. And it's still being published. I don't know how many versions later, but you can find it on Amazon, Man's Search for Meaning. Here are some things that he wrote in this book. He said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Everything can be taken away from a person, but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances, to choose one's way. And he said, what matters is not the meaning of life in general, but rather a specific meaning of a person's, person's life at any given moment. Wow. I want my life to have meaning. Pretty sure you do too. In the midst of the disruption and chaos of a global pandemic, in the growing storm of violence and pain stemming from centuries of systematic racism, I want my life to matter. So here's what I believe. I believe that my life and that your life has meaning and purpose. And I choose to embrace this moment as a gift. That's my discipline in this time right now. To choose to accept this moment of my life as a gift in the joy and in the suffering, in the pain and in the pleasure, in the hazards and in the hopes. A gift given to me to invest. One of my favorite passages of scripture is from Isaiah 43. God was talking to the people that he had left out of Egyptian captivity and led through the Red Sea, conquering everything that stood in their way and caring for every one of their needs along their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. At one point, God stops with these folks and through the prophet says this, Forget about what has happened in the past. Even the litany of wonderful things that God had done for them. Forget about everything that happened in the past. Don't keep going over old history. And in this, be alert. Be present in the moment. I am about to do something brand new. It's bursting out right now. Can you see it? I read that and I thought, maybe what we are experiencing all around us these days are a kind of labor pains globally. And maybe what we are called to be in this present time are the midwives of the new thing that God is birthing in the world. And maybe we start that by starting with ourselves. But you know, we won't know how to do that. We don't know what it means unless we place ourselves in a posture to see it. I've realized these past few weeks that I have control over almost nothing. <laughs> I thought I did. It's an illusion. I can't control the past. It's gone. I can't control the future because it doesn't exist yet. And any time in my life I've tried to push forward into the future and make things happen, most of the time ends in not such a pretty way. So what's left if I can't control any of that? And the answer that came to me is me. I can control me. The secret to doing that is learning how to stay in the present moment, learning how to be present with myself and God. So I want to suggest a couple things that we could do to practice this being with God in the moment. Forgetting about the past, not hooking ourselves in the future, but being here, the gift of this time. 
the things I want to suggest to you are not difficult because we do them all the time without even thinking about it. Now, this may sound silly coming from a sermon, but are you ready? The two things, sitting and breathing. Now, as you're watching this, you're probably doing both of those. You're sitting and you're breathing and you're thinking, big deal. <laughs> I do that all the time. Well, let's think about it for a moment. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. And that word still literally means stop striving, stop fighting, relax, sit still. And remember that I am God. And you are not. When we sit, it's usually as a pause between activities. At least it is for me. I do something, I come and I sit. I get up and I do something else, and I come and I sit. It's kind of like an intermission. But what if sitting was actually the activity? What if sitting was the discipline? Just sitting down and doing nothing is an art. We could say it is the art of non-doing. Now, I just want to suggest that the act of sitting in a place of being present fully is one of the most important things we can do for our own well-being. One of the most important things we can do to be of use for the world. That seems silly, but I really believe it's true. Sitting, and the other part is breathing. Focus on our breathing as we're sitting. And sitting and breathing brings focus to our lives, brings, brings us into this present moment. And in that, provides healing for our souls so that we can bring compassion and healing to a broken world. I'll give you a little example I just thought of, sitting and breathing. Um, I've had some physical challenges the last couple of months from working in a different stance with body aches and twisted muscles and things of that nature. And so I called the doctor and decided maybe I need to figure out what's going on here. And I thought, before I go, I know he's going to ask me to take my blood pressure, so maybe I'll just take it and then I can compare it with his. I called the doctor's office and they said, where are the pains? And I said, my left arm. And the nurse kind of freaked out a little bit. <laughs> I've had a heart attack many years ago. She said, from your shoulder to your hand? I said, yeah, pretty much. She said, well, I'm going to make an appointment for you and you're going to come in today. So I took my blood pressure after hearing that news and it was higher than it has ever been. And I thought, well, I'll take it again. So I rested and I breathed a little bit and I took the blood pressure again and it kept going higher and higher. I was so frantic worrying about what I was going to be stepping into at the doctor's office that I worked up this frenzy. And I caught myself and thought, okay, you're making it worse. So I pushed my way, myself away from the table where I was working and I just closed my eyes found myself sitting in a very comfortable position, feet flat on the floor, shoulders down so that my lungs could breathe and expand properly. And I began to breathe. And I began to be aware of my breathing. I wasn't making myself breathe. My body knows how to do that. But I was taking in air and allowing the air to expel. And I found myself coming to a place of rest. After doing this for several minutes, I got in the car and drove to the doctor's office. The technician came and took my blood pressure and I said, I just got to warn you, it's been really, really high. And she said, actually, it's great. And I said, what? She goes, your blood pressure is fine. And I said, you might want to take it again. She goes, no, trust me, <laughs> it's okay. Somewhere between the panic and that diagnosis, I found a way to relax and be in the moment. And it had a physical effect on me to the point where it was recognized even by my doctor's office. Sitting and breathing brings focus to our lives and healing for our souls. And until we do that, it's hard for us to bring those things to the world. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruah, which literally means breath. The bishop talked about breath in his letter. Some of the music that you're hearing kind of conveys in worship today this sense of peace and calm and being with God in the moment. Ruah, breath. Every time we breathe and we're aware of our breathing, we see it as an important thing, even in our relationship with God. Every time we breathe, 
God is reanimating us. God is filling us again and again and again with Ruah. Spirit, creativity, energy, compassion, joy, and life. Most of the time when I'm practicing this little discipline, I do it on my back patio where I can watch the birds come to one of our two bird feeders or see the antics of the squirrels running around or the chipmunks or the rabbits. And I'm finding more and more time to step away from my work, to step away from my worry, to step away from the stress and be outside and look at the clouds and the trees and the birds and the animals and realize they don't seem to be fretting about anything. Why am I twisted like a pretzel? All of nature is moving forward. I'm the one with a problem. When I sit and allow myself to be and I begin to breathe, I often will connect a prayer with my breathing. Breathing in, I am alive. You are with me, God. I am alive and you are with me. When I feel stress and anxiety or pain, I might say, as I'm breathing in, I feel afraid. I feel stress, I feel anxious. And then exhaling, God, give me peace. Sitting and breathing. As long as I'm sitting still and giving focus to my breath, my mind doesn't wander off to the future, doesn't scurry back to the past. It helps me to be. I sit in stillness, aware of the beauty of the world around me, and as I breathe, I connect with God, who is Ruah, the source of my being. And I reconnect with myself as a beloved child of God. And all the while, I'm preparing myself to be ready for the wider world. Dwelling on the past, being fearful about tomorrow, are not going to cut it for me anymore. I can't live my life that way. I can't. I need to be reminded again and again that all I really have is this day, really, this particular moment. And I want to make it count. Sitting and breathing centers me in this. It doesn't take away a pandemic. It doesn't change the injustice or personal pain that exists in the world. But it makes me, makes me be more available to the source of all life, who is the one who gives me the strength that I need in order to live my life more fully in such a time as this. I invite you even in this moment to sit and breathe. And think about it this coming week. In all the things you experience, find time to sit with God and breathe. I want to offer this prayer as it comes from our hymnal, a very familiar hymn to many of us who have been a part of the church. You can close your eyes and continue sitting and breathing while I share it with you. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will, one will, to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am holy thine. Till all this earthly part of me blows with thy fire divine. This benediction, God be in my sitting and in my breathing. God be in my eyes and in my seeing. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my ears and in my hearing. God be in my love and in my doing to help bring peace, love, and reconciliation. 
to a broken world. Amen and amen. Oh.